Are you looking for iron and sulfur water filtration installation tips and tricks? Maybe you just want to learn more about the whole installation process because you're thinking about saving money by installing one of these great chemical-free iron and sulfur filters for your family. Or maybe you just want to learn more just about the best practices about having a uh, iron and sulfur water filtration system installed uh, for your family. But, you know, where does it go? How is it connected to your plumbing? Um, does it go before or after your water softener if you have one? Um, you know, is this something? Is this something you can really install yourself? I'll bet you absolutely you can. And I'm going to show you how starting right now. Hi, I'm Gary, the Water Guy, and I simplify water filtration to help you conquer crappy water for your family. Uh, this event is perfect for you if you're, like I say, if you're thinking about installing um, one of these iron and sulfur filters to improve the well water for your family. It's going to be a lot of great information presented here today. Um, again, whether you're planning on installing it yourself or having a plumber install it for you, it's really a great idea to, to know all my tips and tricks that I've accumulated over the years in installing these things and also what to what to look for what not to do so that you can avoid some of the disasters that I've seen and yeah some of them I've even caused myself uh, when installing these uh, systems and uh, so by the end of this live stream you'll have all the information you need to uh, to comfortably know how to install one of these iron sulfur filters for your family and uh, um, also, I'm encouraging you to uh, watch this video right to the end because um, throughout this whole live stream, I'm going to have lots of information, not only, like I say, my tips and tricks along the way, but I'm also going to be um, uh, presenting a lot of information about, uh, like I say, some of the disasters I've seen and how you can avoid them for your family. So uh, definitely encourage you to do that. I'm also encouraging you to chime in and ask your questions and comments. I see we're all already got to have a couple up there already. And that's great because this is the right time for you to ask those uh, questions and comments and I'll be happy to um, to answer them live here on YouTube. And by the way, during this live stream, I'll also be sharing some really, really exciting news about my Gary the Water Guy YouTube channel. And you'll definitely want to uh, hang around for that. And now whether you're watching this live or the replay, welcome. Of course, the advantages of watching this live is that uh, you can ask your questions and hear them uh, answered in real time right here on YouTube. The replay is great too, because if there's some information that's presented here and you want to go back and review that in the future, you definitely can. And uh, this video will be going live on uh, YouTube pretty much right after it's uh, the live stream is finished today. And uh, and then we'll, we'll finish uh, doing a, cleaning up a little bit, publishing it uh, between tomorrow and the weekend and then you've got some great information there that you can come back to time and time again and uh, you know, during this live stream you'll, you'll notice that I'll be indicating like this and what I'm talking about there is in the description down below I'll have links to a lot of the things that I'm talking about during this live stream and uh, um, and also the products all the products we'll be talking about here today are on our e-commerce stores uh, watereastore.ca in Canada watereastore.com in the US and while you're getting questions ready, think about, you know, uh, what, what do you want to ask? Um, uh, how does it work? Is that what you'd like to know? Uh, what should you look for when you're choosing a system? Uh, pros and cons of big box store systems. We'll be talking about that. Uh, can you install this yourself? Well, of course, that's the whole process. That's the whole reason for having this live stream today, right? And, um, uh, and, and I'll be, be touching on a little bit of troubleshooting and, uh, and repair advice. Although, like I say, this is really orientated toward... Um, the the live stream now um before before we um, set up for this on my community tab of my uh, gary the water guy youtube channel i posted this uh, question uh about a week or so ago and i normally do this before a live stream i'm asking you know where's the interest what what are you folks interested in learning about during this live stream and uh so the the what was identified more than anything else is where to install the iron and sulfur filter um how to correct how to connect it to your plumbing and, and sorry that was number one number two was iron and sulfur filter programming so we're definitely going to touch on that today um how to put it into service once you've uh, connected it that's a uh, always a big question for people and uh, so we're definitely talking about that and then uh, how to connect it to your plumbing and the drain that's often a question i get emails about all the time and uh, about solder free installations and uh, for your do-it-yourselfers out there that maybe aren't so great at soldering there's definitely opportunities to do a solder free installation and um let's go back here 
And uh, so let's see if we've got any questions up here already. And we'll have a quick look here. And uh, we've got a question already here from uh, T. Kluper. Um, can this kind of system remove 0.55 milligrams per liter, which is also parts per million, by the way, and, and uh, 0.19 milligrams per liter of manganese? And uh, uh, this uh, comment was made by somebody that uh, stopped using their water softener due to excessive amount of water to back flush and all the salt that it used. Well, it depends. And as you'll find as we go through this uh, presentation, manganese um, are FOK. Iron sulfur filters do remove manganese, but the pH has to be of, above a certain amount. And like I say, we'll be talking about as, as we go through. Definitely the iron content, all of our FOCs, FOBs, FOKs can definitely handle your iron content. It's just the manganese. Normally we get rid of manganese by using a water softener. But, uh, but thanks for your comment. And uh, I got another one here for John. Welcome, John. Can you tell me what the FO stands for in the FOB, FOC, and FOK systems? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, um, it's part of my topics I'll be getting to, uh, through today. But basically what it means, it just means that it's an air over media iron and sulfur filter. What, what the, the exact letter F and the letter O stands for in that context, I don't know. I've asked a number of people and no one's ever been able to answer that. But it just means an air over media iron sulfur filter. And the B, C, and the K stands for the media that's inside the tank. All right, very good. Thanks for those uh, questions. Let's, uh, let's see what other questions uh, you have. Please keep them coming. And uh, so during this live stream, I'm also doing a poll. And again, you know, people submitted questions ahead of time, but they may not be here during this live stream. So I want to make sure that I'm tailoring this exactly to uh, you, to you folks that are watching here right now. And uh, so let's just see here. So you can see here, so this is uh, what's on your screen right now. If you click in the top right hand corner, that poll will drop down and you can vote on that poll. And, uh, and I'll be checking in uh, during this live stream and just kind of see, um, you know, how many uh, people are uh, participating in the poll. And uh, so I got three votes already. That's pretty good. And we just started. So definitely encourage you to get in there and, uh, and uh, submit your questions on there. And, uh, and that would be great. And uh, so I guess one of the big questions before we actually get into the installation part, and that is why are these systems significant? Well, they're so significant because iron, you know, iron and sulfur has been a concern for a long time. But as more and more people are going to rural properties, to cottages, to cabins and things like that, and making those their homes, me, myself, I actually live in a cottage year round um, up here in uh, Georgian Bay, uh, about 100 miles north of Toronto for you uh, folks in the U.S. that are watching this. And, uh, and because of that, I've got iron in my water, I've got sulfur in my water, I've got hard water, etc. So what's happened is that there's been a real need for it. Now, years ago, we used to have these systems that used potassium permanganate as a regenerate. In case any of you uh, have uh, had one of those kind of systems, it's, it's a dark purple powder that stains your hands brown. It's a uh, real messy stuff. That stuff was wicked on your septic system. And uh, so what's happened is that over the years, we've gone to more and more um, chemical free systems that use air to oxidize the iron and the sulfur out of the water. And, uh, and over the years, there's been a number of different systems. There's been a lot of compromises, but definitely these ones are the best ones yet. Uh, they don't restrict your water flow and uh, they do a phenomenal job. So, uh, so the technology is really great. It's, it, like I say, it was a real game changer when these ones uh, came, came about. Now, um, I do have a great YouTube video that talks about how these work and uh, it looks a whole lot like this. And again, I've got a link in the description uh, down below that'll like, explain to you that video. Definitely, if you don't know how these systems work, I definitely encourage you to check them out. Um, but basically how they work is this, is inside this tank, there's a big air bubble inside here. Uh, about the top quarter or so is air bubble. And when you, you run your water anywhere in the household, it sprays your water through that air bubble. And what that does, as soon as it hits the air, it oxidizes the iron and the sulfur out of the water. Then as the water passes down through the media that's inside, that's about, fills about the bottom half or so of the tank, it captures, that media captures that oxidized iron sulfur, holds it in place, the water continues down, now iron and sulfur free to a screen at the bottom, goes into an inlet, up a tube, up through the middle, and goes on to your whole house. And uh, so for three days, it goes through that cycle. After three days of use, it regenerates. And when it regenerates, 
it goes through two, basically two cycles. First of all, it backwashes. So now it reverses the flow. Water goes down through the middle, out through the screen. It expands that media, pushes out that air bubble, expands the media to fill the whole tank, and then it flushes all the debris to the drain. Then, that's the first cycle. The second cycle, through, through the top here, yeah, you can see that up here. Through the top, it sucks in air and it rebuilds that air bubble, settles the media back down and puts it back into service. So like I say, the obvious advantages are no chemicals are used, no salt is used, no filter cartridges to change. It just constantly goes through that cycle every three days. And, uh, and like I say, it, it's, it's really a, f a phenomenal system. All right, so, um, so the first step in, um, in, in your installation of one of these uh, great systems is what you're investing in. And uh, what I mean by that is, is the quality of the system that you're investing in. So the systems that we have are Hume, um, water filtration, iron and sulfur filters, all use the CLAC WS1 valve. The valve's made in USA. The whole systems are assembled in North America. And, uh, and they're real quality systems. I mean, these things will last 20 years, no problem. I've been actually in this industry for 20 years. Now, this technology wasn't around 20 years ago, but the valves were around 20 years ago, and the ones that we installed 20 years ago are still doing their good job out there, so they definitely last a long time. And the media, the berm media, yep, we used that 20 years ago, and again, that's been lasting a, a, a long time. Now, depending on your iron content and things like that, you may have to um, replace that media, but the system itself, like I say, will easily last 20 years. So, uh, so definitely uh, check that out. And... Um, uh, and like I say, we have uh, our Hume line it consists of three units, the FOB, FOC, and FOK. And again, we use the, the mighty CLAC WS1 valve, the best water filtration valve in the industry, bar none. And uh, so, um, well, I mean, you can, you can definitely get iron and sulfur filters from big box stores. You can actually even get them from Amazon. But <laughs> they've got some really, really poor valves on them. They've got some really, really poor equipment. I was helping out uh, a family not that long ago that uh, didn't have an air over media iron and sulfur filter. It, they actually had a tannin filter, um, but it was a weird brand that I'd never heard of. I called them for technical support because I, I couldn't figure out what was going on with the valve. And uh, they said, oh, we only get technical support for units that are less than a year old. In fact, the person that I was talking to, it was a tannin filter, and the person I was talking to was their head technical support person. When I asked, the, the, I said it was for a tannin filter, they said, what's a tannin filter? So you gotta make sure that what you're investing in here is, uh, this is gonna last a long time, so you need to invest in something that has great support. Great support, like I say, from companies like Clack, and great support from people like me that make YouTube videos that will help you uh, with these systems, not only installation, but also you know how to maintain it, how to uh, troubleshoot it if something goes wrong in the future, and when it comes time to replace that media or whatever other components might need to be replaced, again, Again, we've got YouTube videos that'll show you how, and again, you can order those replacement parts, no problem. All right, so let's see, we're getting some more questions here, and I definitely don't want to get behind on those. And uh, justice for all, Gary, what all do these filter systems remove? Generally speaking, iron and sulfur, um, but like I say, the FOK unit, which uses the Catalox media, also removes manganese but again, under certain conditions. So they don't soften the water. They don't lower the mineral content of your water. It's not like a reverse osmosis system. It doesn't kill bacteria. Um, it doesn't get rid of lead. It doesn't get rid of sodium, all those kinds of things. It just gets rid of iron and sulfur. But great question, thank you for that. Um, and T. Klooper, again, how long does the back uh, flush cycle run for? Um, out of the box, they're programmed 15 minutes for the backwash and then 30 minutes for the brine draw. Now, during the backwash, the water flow is, is pretty quick, you know, so the water's flowing quite quickly. So for 15 minutes, the water's flowing fa fairly quickly. So, I, I mean, it's probably the backwash is probably going to take about 40 gallons of water, 45 gallons of water, something like that, if that's why you're asking that question. And then when it goes through the, the air draw cycle, where it uh, rebuilds that air bubble, the flow is almost nothing. It's very, very slow. It's just creating that venturi effect to suck in air through here into the system. But thank you for the question. And again, everyone, keep those questions coming. I really appreciate it. And uh, so we're up to disaster number one. So um, uh, uh, someone uh, contacted me and they said that, um, that uh, a plumber 
installed for them an air over media iron sulfur filter, but it wasn't working at all. And he couldn't figure out why. And uh, so anyway, after some, some careful back and forth, we found out that the guy just took a water softener tank, put in the iron and sulfur media, stuck on <laughs> the air intake, and put it into service. And uh, unfortunately, it was still programmed as a water softener. It didn't have the room for the air pocket in here. It wasn't set up correctly. So it wasn't an iron sulfur filter at all. They just happened to spend the big bucks on the media to use that, but it didn't work. So you have to realize these systems are all integrated, okay? The valve itself, just because the valve, this valve looks exactly the same as the valve on a water softener, means that you can spin it off this one, put it on a water softener, and you're good to go. Absolutely not. The programming is completely different, as you'll find when we talk about that a little bit later. But also, there's all kinds of venturis in here, drain line flow control, um, like I say, the air draw, the size of the tank is very important for these systems. So, um, and again, that customer had nothing but grief with that. So I was sorry to, to, to see about that. And... Um, so we were talking a little bit earlier about my websites. And uh, again, so if you can go to watereastore.ca in Canada, watereastore.com in the US, we offer free shipping coast to coast in each of those countries and each of those websites. So I definitely encourage you to uh, check that out. And uh, let's see what else we got going on here. Um, great. And you know, you'll hear me talking from time to time about Hume water filtration. In fact, you can actually see the logo right here, I'll show it to you a little bit better there. And that's our own private label brand. So again, we get the, the valves from Clack and, uh, and we get all the, the, the tanks, etc., from other suppliers, etc. And then these are built to our specification. Um, and again, Hume water filtration, if you need some more information about that, um, again, I'll, I definitely encourage you. Just, just add it in the comments down below if you're looking for more information. I have a great YouTube video that explains what exactly that is. Basically, the Hume uh, water filtration products are the best of the best. I mean, after 20 years, I definitely uh, saw what products work great, what products don't, what products are a bunch of useless bells and whistles, and which ones aren't and uh, and that all those the great products end up being Hume water filtration products all right so um, so again modern iron and sulfur filters are available FOB FOC and FOK and uh, and there's a bunch of information you need to know which ones to select and uh, so we're going to talk about that a little bit now um, what the B stands for berm that's one kind of media the C stands for catalytic carbon again a very special kind of carbon not just any kind of carbon um, and uh, K stands for K-LOX. K-LOX is the newest media of the bunch. So uh, let's have a look here. So before you, make, uh, before you decide, well, which one's best for me, Gary? Um, I need some information. And uh, so this is the kind of information uh, we need from folks. Um, we need to know your iron content in parts per million. We need to know the sulfur content in parts per million. Now that one's a little bit uh, a little bit difficult to get. You'd have to send that to an actual uh, full lab to do the testing for you to find out your actual sulfur amount. That's only really important if your sulfur content is incredibly high, like just unbelievably high. If it's a moderate amount of sulfur, um, that's good enough. Manganese, and again, if you're getting that black staining that we were hearing about a little bit earlier by T. E. Kluper, I guess. Um, uh, then we would need to know the parts per million of manganese, the pH. So the pH is very important, and that's something people often overlook. They say, oh, I got so many parts per million of iron. Gary, what do I need? And uh, so that, that, that's definitely important information. Uh, flow rate from your well pump. And if you don't know that, I'll show you, I'll, uh, I'll speak to you about how you can get that information and the number of people in your household. Well, that's an easy one, right? All right, so that's the kind of information we need. So now, why do we need this information? Well, it becomes a little bit uh, more obvious here when we're getting into this. So you can see here, um, there's three different units, the FOB, FOC, and the FOK. So if we, let me just um, have a quick look here, do this in the preview. Okay, and I'll just switch over to this here. Oh, here it is here. All right, great. So you can see here um, the FOB, the pH. So it requires a pH between 6.8 and 9. If you've got a pH of 6.5 or 6.2 or 6.1, it may not work. So keep that in mind. Um, the microns. So what that means is uh, as it backwashes, it's also going to get rid of dirt, sediment in your water. How, how fine will it um, get rid of the, how fine will it uh, get rid of that dirt down to? Like how many microns? 60 microns for an FOB. 
How many parts per million of iron can FOB get rid of? Well, it can get rid of four parts per million, sulfur one part per million, and manganese zero parts per million. So then we go to the FOC. So the FOC again requires 6.8 uh, pH, a little bit 6.7, 6.6, you might be okay, but 6.8, definitely everything will work up to nine. Again, 60 microns, uh, parts per million is six parts per million. Huh, sorry, parts per million of iron in an FOC is one part per million. Sulfur is two parts per million. And manganese, again, nothing. So then we get to the FOK. Now the FOK works on a, a larger band of uh, pH. It'll, it'll go down to 6.0 parts per million. And when you're on well water, um, the, the pH does vary quite a bit from location to location to location. So, um, but it will also uh, remove sediment down to three microns. So again, it'll give you that very fine sediment uh, filtration, which is great. Uh, parts per million for iron, again, nine parts per million. So that's super high. That's great news. Sulfur, two parts per million. Again, that's great news. Manganese, one part per million. And again, that's great news. But there are some limitations about the manganese and uh, we'll just check in with that in just a second here. And, uh, so um, if you don't know your iron content, you don't know the pH of your water, um, if you also want to know the hardness and the total dissolved solids of your water, you can mail us a water sample. We do free water testing for you. And uh, so just, uh, you know, 16 ounces or so, or 500 milliliters of water, um, a nice secure container like a Dasani water bottle, you know, a fairly strong water bottle, wrap it up, mail it to this address, and we can test it for you for free. Make sure to include your email address so that um, we can uh, know where to respond to, right? Very important. And, uh, okay, great. Let me see if we're getting any more questions here. I'm going to get out of here. And uh, uh, right here, justice for all, another question. Great. Keep those questions coming. I really appreciate it. And, uh, whoops, you just send it here. There it is. Should you install a whole house filter system in front of this system? Um, when I talk about uh, filter um, location of the equipment, where the equipment is going to be located, I'm going to touch on that. And I'm going to touch on what kind of. Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, is 100% necessary? Not necessarily. It depends if you have a lot of dirt in your water or not. Um, but that's a great question. And again, I'll talk, speak to that a little bit more and uh, go for that. And again, um, Justice for All is asking, and how do you size the system to um, your, your cust customer's needs? Well, we're just getting into the sizing of that whole thing. So, but thanks for the question. We're definitely going to look after you. And uh, T. Klooper is asking, um, my pH is 6.4. So again, that, again, that's great information. So with a pH of 6.4, you're definitely going to be considering the FOK for your family, and uh, which is good because that's going to get rid of the iron, um, but it's not going to, get, but it's bad because it's not going to get rid of the manganese. So unfortunately, if you want to get rid of that manganese, you're going to have to put that water softener back online. Sorry, just how it works. All right, great. So uh, more, qu more uh, disasters. So installing an FOB, which is best for removing iron, but not sulfur with a customer at high um, sulfur. Yeah, so that this happens fairly often. And uh, again, uh, we do a lot of work with plumbers and we really appreciate working with plumbers. But sometimes what happens, customer says, hey, I need an iron filter to their plumber. Their plumber calls up their whoever supplies them with equipment says, hey, I need an iron filter. They get an iron filter and they install it. They don't check in terms of how much iron the customer has, what the pH the customer has, if there's sulfur, you know, all these other kinds of things. So what sometimes happens, and unfortunately, too often, is that a product like an FOB, which has been around the longest, gets installed for something like sulfur. Because someone will say, hey, does an FOB work for sulfur? Yeah, it works. Okay, I'll put that in. So again, there's some more information. And that's one of the reasons um, you know, why people come to my YouTube channel, because I break down the information in a way that you can understand it, right? Simplify water filtration to help you conquer crappy water for your family. That's what we do here. So, all right. Great, so let's go on. And um, so installation. For example, the FOB and the FOC. Uh, so, uh, sorry. Yeah, so I was talking about flow rate a little bit earlier. So, um, did I? Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. 
Okay, so flow rate. So one thing that, so a lot of folks say to me, well, why don't I just buy an FOK? It sounds like it's the largest span of, um, of pH. It's, it does the highest amount of iron. It also does manganese if you've got the right pH. It does high amounts of sulfur. Sounds like the best choice. The problem is the flow rate. So FOBs and FOCs will work fine at 5.3 gallons per minute of flow rate coming from your well pump. Um, FOK, the smallest size unit, the one cubic foot unit, requires six and a half gallons per minute flow rate. And believe me, there's a big difference between six and a half gallons per minute flow rate and 5.3 gallons per minute flow rate. So um, that's one thing you need to keep in mind. Again, I told you I live in a cottage year round and my flow rate's only about 5.5 gallons per minute. So in my situation, I can't use an FOK. So that's what uh, becomes... Uh, and, and again, once you get to the larger size units, they require a higher and higher flow rate. All right, so I've got uh, what I consider a great YouTube video that uh, shows you how to calculate the flow rate from your well pump. I mean, if you've got a well report, you can often find that information there. But if you don't have a proper well report, you got to figure it out yourself. And uh, so again, in the... Uh, in the description down below, I've got some links, and one of the links there is how to is that video that shows you how. It's a pretty simple process. Just go through it step by step, and uh, you'll have no problem. All right, so now we get into sizing and capacity of flow rates required. Okay, so now we're going to do just the FOB first. Okay, so um, and I, I mentioned for a one cubic foot, which is the smallest size uh, FOB, which by the way is smallest size is 62 inches tall. So these things are tall. Uh, one cubic foot requires 5.3 gallons per minute. And if your iron content is two parts per million or less, that's fine for one to four people, no problem. If your iron content is two parts per million or more, up to four parts per million, which is most, excuse me, which is all that the uh, FOB can handle, um, it will handle uh, only up to two people. So bear that in mind. So then you can go to a 1.5 cubic foot FOB but now you need seven and a half gallons per minute flow rate. So you can see how why the flow rate is so important. And uh, for less than two parts per million, uh, four to six people, no problem. But if you have over two parts per million, two to four people. So again, you can see as, as, as we get larger, the flow rate is, is more important. Uh, and of course the iron content is more important too. So uh, keep that in mind. So now let's go to the FOC. So the FOC, again, one cubic foot, 62 inches tall, 5.3 gallons per minute, and uh, less than two parts per million of iron, one to four. Uh, over two parts per million of iron, well, you can't use an FOC for over two parts per million of iron. And then again, you can see as the size goes up, so does the gallons per minute flow rate requirement. So very important stuff there. Oh, and last but definitely not least is the FOK. So again, one cubic foot FOK requires six and a half gallons per minute flow rate, Less than two parts per million of iron, that'll do up to one to four people, but especially if you're getting up to that eight or nine parts per million of iron, it's only going to do one to two people. So then you have to get up to a, you know, if you've got a family of four kind of thing, then, you're, then you have to have at least nine gallons per minute flow rate to be able to use an FOK. So keep those things in mind uh, when you're planning these things out. All right, great. So which one is best for your family? Okay, so basically, how do, you, how do you choose, right? So the first thing you do is you go to, you find out your iron and your sulfur content. And then from your iron sulfur content and based on your pH, then uh, like we were talking about with uh, T. Uh, Kluper here earlier, is that because his pH is less than um, uh, 6.8, then he's, uh, um, he has to go with an FOK. That's the only unit that will handle his lower pH. Okay, so then you go to the number of people in your household. Now, the number of people in the, and of course the iron content, right? Um, his iron content was 0.6 parts per million, so that's relatively low. So uh, for a family, assuming he has a flow rate of 6.5 gallons per minute or more, okay, he can easily go with a one gallon, one cubic foot uh, FOK iron and sulfur filter, okay? As long as it's 6.5 gallons per minute flow rate, right? And uh, and, and then he's good to go. But again, for manganese, you have to add that water softener back in. Um, and by the way, the, I, I get a lot of emails about this, and I understand why people are asking this question, but you cannot use these for irrigation systems. I didn't put that in the list of disasters, but that's one of the disasters that I made uh, some years ago. A very large, a very expensive, a very high-end property. Um, 
was getting a lot of iron in their property. We took care of the, the household water, no problem, but then they had an irrigation system and because uh, they were getting these uh, iron stains all over the rocks when the irrigation system was spraying. I mean, really bad on the rocks. So we put in a great big FOK. Luckily, they had the, the capacity to handle it. They had the flow rate to be able to handle it. But the problem was, I mean, <laughs> when you think about there's four zones and each zone runs for, I don't know, uh, 20 minutes or 25 minutes or something like that. And it's pumping out 10 or 12 gallons per minute. I mean, if you do the arithmetic, <laughs> it's a huge amount of water way more than these things can supply. So they cannot be used for irrigation system. What you do need for your irrigation system, I don't know. You have to ask an irrigation guy. So I can't really help you with that. Disaster number three, installed it, someone, not me, someone else installed a two cubic foot um, Tatalox air over media iron and sulfur filter uh, for somebody and didn't test the flow rate. And, uh, and they found out and, and they, the customer contacted me when, guess what, the guy that put it in wasn't returning their calls anymore. And uh, when they contacted me and I asked them, what's your flow rate? I gave them the, the, inst the video on how to calculate it, etc. We found out the flow rate was way too low for the two, part, two cubic foot uh, FOK. And uh, we haven't taken it much past there. He's been doing some other work on that and hopefully uh, we can get it to work for him. And then we'll have to make some decisions about what we're going to do uh, moving ahead from there. So uh, big disaster for that, uh, those folks. And uh, so what happens is, just so you know, they work fine initially. They work great. But the problem is it can't backwash the media. It can't lift the media to, to expand it into the tank, to flush out all the debris to the drain. And if it can't clean that media, eventually it's just going to stop working, stop doing its job. So that's a problem. Okay, let's talk about where. One of the big uh, questions that people were interested in and, and uh, people are answering in, in, the, um, in the poll is where do these things get installed? And, and by the way, I see six of you already voted on the poll and that's great. I appreciate a lot more of you voting. That really helps me tailor the presentation too. So where does this get installed? So it needs to be installed after your pressure tank, but before your water softener. Now, if you have um, uh, backwashable sediment filters or spin down filters or that kind of thing. They can also go after the pressure tank, but before the FOB, FOC or FOK. And why you would have that is if there's a lot of dirt in your water, this thing does a great job, FOB, FOC and FOK does a great job of filtering out dirt, especially the FOK. But if there's a lot of it, eventually it will clog it. And that's why a spin down filter or a backwashable sediment filter, or even just a very coarse 75, 25 sediment filter before this will protect the system and uh, keep the dirt out. You know, So that's uh, definitely something to keep in mind. Also your outside faucets, you'd wanna have that come off before the system. Okay, irrigation systems come off before the system because otherwise you're going to deplete its capacity and you won't have anything for your household use. And uh, everybody's going to say, hey, we invested all this money and nothing's working. How come? And that's how come. And um, so now just because this, this is located, like I said, before the water softener, doesn't mean it has to physically stand before the water softener in terms of your flow. What it means is it needs to be connected to the plumbing before the water softener. So it, as long as it can go to and come, come back, that's what's uh, really important. So I've got this great little uh, infographic here that we put together and, uh, and you can see where, where the uh, equipment goes. So um, the iron and sulfur filter is actually F. So what I've got here, obviously A is, is the well, B is the pressure tank, and then C is a spin down filter. Now that's something I don't talk a lot about, but I do have one here today, I want to show it to you. <clears throat> and this is a spin down filter here. Are we focusing? Uh, I gotta move it in front of my face. So this is a spin down filter here, okay? And basically how it works is uh, some arrows here. Water goes in through here and then continues on from here. Again, this goes after your pressure tank. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Let me go to full screen again. Sorry about that. Okay, so this is a spin down filter here. Okay, you can see it here. And uh, so what happens is this gets installed before, uh, right after the pressure tank. It does very coarse filtering. So water flows in through this side, goes through the filter and out through this side. And why it's called a spin down filter is it has this valve on the bottom, sorry, this valve on the bottom here. And then so once a week or whenever this is clogged with dirt, you have to manually go and open this up and it creates a centrifugal force. You put a bucket underneath here and it flushes all the dirt and all the heavy lifting that this has been doing and flushes it into a bucket. And that's what's called a spin down filter. 
and uh and they're great for doing the heavy lifting but like i say the best the, the finest micron uh, filter you can get for that is 60 microns so it's not very fine uh, but it does a great job of the heavy lifting so let me go back to this uh, chart here so again a spin down filter you would go first d is a 20 inch big blue filter housing where you'd have like i say a, a coarse filter in there maybe a 75 micron or 75 to 25 dual gradient uh, filter something like that and again it protects the um the air over media iron and sulfur filter and then e on this so this is an automatic backwashing filter and again if you have a lot of dirt in your water and you don't want to constantly be opening up that spin down filter or constantly be replacing the filter cartridges and that 75 25 now this is extreme cases right then you'd have this automatic backwashing sediment filter before the fob foc or fok and then you can see after that there's a water softener this one has a tannin filter and then it goes on to the ultraviolet light the reverse osmosis system and of course to the whole household so again this is this is showing you everything that could be needed in a situation like that this doesn't mean that every installation requires all these pieces of equipment it just shows that if you were required if you um, required a number of these pieces of equipment where they would go relative to each other and that's the important information so uh, i like that cool infographic let me know if you like it um, i appreciate your feedback on uh, things like that speaking about feedback let me see if there's some more questions here nope Come on, guys, let's get some questions going here. All right, great. So, uh, so we'll carry on. Disaster number four. Um, installed, yeah. So sometimes what happens is people, you know, people don't get all their water filtration equipment at once, right? Um, you, know, you move into a place or something like that, and you've got a sediment problem from your well water. You might put in a backwashable sediment filter. And then maybe you realize you're getting some hard water staining and, and you've had the water tested and the water's hard, so you put in a water softener. But then you realize the iron content was higher than what uh, the water softener could handle. So now you're looking at an iron filter. Well, the problem is sometimes people that, that aren't in this industry all the time don't necessarily know what order the equipment goes in. So one of the disasters I ran into recently was someone installed the iron sulfur filter after the water softener. Well, the only problem with that is the water softener also removes iron, but only up to about one part per million of iron. So if you have higher than that, the water softener ends up getting clogged from iron. The iron and sulfur filter ends up doing pretty much nothing. And, uh, and then <laughs> the water softener either needs to be replaced or the media needs to be changed or definitely needs some work. So again, that's very important that the equipment's put in the right order. All right, so where do you actually locate it? So again, anywhere that, that you've got a, a nice flat uh, surface, you can get access to the plumbing, um, you get access to the plumbing. Now, you know, because these are on well water, so well water situations are all over, all over the place. You can have cabins that have no basement, no crawl space whatsoever. You can have cottages where the crawl space consists of a huge boulder <laughs> within that crawl space and at one end of the crawl space it might be five feet tall the other end of the crawl space it might be zero feet tall you know you can get all that kind of situation or situations uh, like my place for example that has a full basement and uh, and you could install it there so obviously it needs to be installed near the pressure tank now if you have a crawl space and like i say these things are 62 inches tall and your crawl space is less than 62 inches tall now i'm talking about the underside of the floor, right? If you have floor joists, you can actually put these between the floor joists, and we often do. So when you're measuring for the height, the height that you need, again, it's to the underside of the floor. From, from the base of the crawl space, the, whatever floor you have, if it's a dirt floor, whatever you have, up to there. Speaking about dirt floors, by the way, again, in uh, cottage or cabin installations, sometimes we run into crawl spaces that just have a dirt floor. There's nothing saying that you can't excavate down a little bit further, and we have in the past, excavate down another foot or sometimes even a foot and a half, put a patio stone down there, put this onto the patio stone, connect up the plumbing, and you're good to go. Other alternatives... So again, we run into uh, crawl spaces that are only a foot and a half or two feet high. And uh, those are real crawl spaces. And uh, so with situations like that, what we do there is we install these in a closet or somewhere like that. We've installed them in kitchens. We've installed them in uh, bathrooms, uh, you know, all over the place in cottages. So all we do is um, we just install them fairly close to where the pressure tank is. We run the plumbing uh, along the... The, the ceiling of the crawl space, if you like, and then just drill three holes, 
One for the water line go going up to the um, FOC of, you know, the uh, air over media iron sulfur filter. One for the water line coming back down and reconnecting. And then third for the drain line coming down. And again, the drain line we connect underneath the floor to the plumbing. And we'll talk about drain line connections in uh, just a minute. So, um, you know, it, it, it's wherever you can get access. But do keep in mind one thing, and that is when you're locating this thing, is that when it starts up, and it pushes out that air bubble, it's noisy. It's only noisy for the first four or five seconds, but if it's in a closet or something like that, and it's in a bedroom closet, you, you'll definitely wake people up. So how you get around that, you can set the regen time when it goes through that cycle um, at different times. So you can, the idea is you want it to go through that cycle at a time when there's very little water usage in the home cottage or cabin, right? So, but you can set it to go, uh, if it waking up people at 2 a.m., then you can always set it for 2 p.m. Just make everyone aware in the property that between 2 and 3 p.m., no showers, no doing laundry, that kind of thing. And then you can go do it that way. All right. Another thing to keep in mind is that these tanks cannot freeze. Okay. I'll talk about winterization in a minute. They can definitely be winterized, but you can't put them outside and have them freeze. And uh, very important to keep in mind. And um, great. Uh, okay, great. And um, so something else uh, people often ask me about is uh, if we're on Instagram, if we're on Facebook and uh, things like that. And we do have that right here. And uh, so our Facebook is watereastore.com, uh, <laughs> watereastore.ca um, in Canada, watereastore uh, dash <laughs> US in the US. And our Instagram is at waterspace underscore uh, e-store and uh, and again we've also all, always got great information on there and i definitely encourage you uh, to uh, check that out all right great um super and you saw the subscribe uh thing come up there again and again if you want to um if you want to be notified about the new YouTube videos, they become available, uh, or you want to find out about the live streams, they become available, I definitely encourage you to subscribe. Got a lot of information and a lot of great YouTube videos, over 350 uh, YouTube videos about water filtration. Disaster number five, we're up to Texas. So last winter, I don't think it was last winter, I think it was the winter before, Texas had a big f deep freeze. And a lot of the folks in Texas installed their water filtration equipment outside. So what happened is a lot of the tanks burst, a lot of the valves burst. We supplied a lot of parts to a lot of the folks in Texas um, to repair them. Cause there's a lot of clack valves that people uh, purchase down there and, and equipment that has, uh, actually we, we ship a lot of uh, Hume water filtration equipment to uh, Texas. And uh, so, um, so again, be careful. If you're in an area where these things might freeze, if your temperatures drop down to below freezing, be careful if you put them outside because they will burst. So you can put it as long as it's an insulated area. Hey, no problem at all. But uh, yeah, so let's talk about winterizing. So if, you, if you're in a cottage or cabin, and let's say you only use it for three seasons, during the wintertime you leave, you drain the whole cottage or cabin, what do you do with this thing? You can definitely winterize it. And again, I've got a great YouTube video that shows you how to do that. Um, this is what the thumbnail looks like. And again, I've got a, a link in the description down below. Uh, basically, it's, uh, it's actually fairly straightforward. Um, what you do is you bypass it with the bypass that's on the back here. You bypass it. You put it into a regeneration cycle to release the pressure. And then you disconnect it between the bypass and the valve itself. Actually, I can probably zoom in there a little bit for you. Yeah, I, you can bypass it right through here. Oh, sorry, you can disconnect it right through here once you've bypassed it, of course. And, um, and then um, disconnect it. Yeah, there's going to be a little bit of water leaks out, etc. cetera. But, um, and then from there, um, you lay it down and uh, this part being lower than the bottom, right, to drain all of the water out. It takes a while to drain it out. If you have a compressor, you can actually blow into the, into the, um, the unit and blow the water out and then leave it sit horizontally over the winter time. Uh, oh, there's also up a couple other uh, little extra things I encourage you to do. But again, that, that video goes into detail for the whole process. And, uh, and then you leave it horizontal for the winter time. And, um, and then in the spring, you come back, hook it up, and you're good to go. So, uh, so definitely no problem winterizing it. Okay, let's see if we've got some more questions coming up here. I hope we do. I hope we do. Yes. Patrick, welcome, Patrick. Is there maintenance for an 
iron over media filter after system has been installed. Yes, there is. Um, how much maintenance depends on your water test results, how much iron you have basically. And uh, so there's an injector inside here. Let's see if I can turn this a little bit so you can see it like this. And I'll zoom in here again for a minute. So up in here, there's an injector. And uh, so um, that injector uh, will get clogged with iron eventually. And um, so here yeah that'll get in, uh, clogged with iron so what you need to do is you know again there's a process and again I've got a YouTube video that shows you exactly how to do that so basically you just open it up and um, uh, remove the injector clean it out and or replace it um, they're, they're very inexpensive they're less than 20 bucks so usually recommend just to replace it and then put it back in while you've got that opened up there's a bit of cleaning that has to go on in there after a number of years again if you've got lots of iron in your water um, again I've got a, a YouTube video that shows you how to run chlorine through it to clean out the media that definitely helps and after a number of years anywhere from Again, depending on your iron content anywhere from 10 to 20 years, you may have to replace the media inside the tank and uh, but again it, it depends on how much water you use and how bad your water is so but great question thank you for that Patrick and we got another question here Stephen advantage of an air over media iron filter over an iron pro 2 um, don't know I don't know what an iron pro 2 is sorry uh, Stephen um, if you want you can send me an email with uh, asking me that exact same question I'll do a little bit of research on that and I can compare the two and um, uh, here and this is where you would contact us people ask me what our website or what our email address is and it's info at wateristore.com and uh, that's where you can contact us Stephen I encourage you to send me an email and I'll check that out uh, for you and uh, we can go from there great and here all right and uh, Great. Uh, yeah, so we're all caught up on questions. Please keep those questions coming. Like I say, this uh, event is for you, and please uh, keep voting on that poll. I appreciate if you do that. Top right-hand corner of your screen, by the way, that's where the poll is. So what do you need to know in terms of doing this installation? So first of all, you need to know how you're going to get access to the plumbing. You're going to need to know uh, what size the plumbing is after your pressure tank. And um, you're going to need to know where you're going to hook up to the drain. Like I said, we're going to talk about drainage uh, connection in, in a moment. And uh, you're also going to need to know if there's an electrical outlet nearby to plug this in. So that those are some of the information you need to know. What size your plumbing is, what it's made out of, copper, PEX, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And, um, and where, where there's hydro. And uh, so, <laughs> speaking about hydro, disaster number six. Um, Inst installed one of these. This is one of my faux pas, if you like. Um, installed one of these and plugged it into an electrical outlet, set it up. Everything was working fine. Customer called back uh, a few days later, said it was working phenomenally, super happy, everything was great, that kind of thing. Called back two weeks ago, said it's not working at all, can't figure out why. I went back, had a look at it. The time was off, but it seemed to be working and that, etc. Anyway, make a long story short, I plugged it into an outlet that was on a switch. So whenever they turned on the lights, the power was on. When they turned the lights off, the power was off. So of course the power was off, it wasn't going through its cycles and it wasn't working. So make sure you plug it into an electrical outlet that is, uh, that is uh, hooked up. All right, so typically we ship these systems with three quarter inch tail kits. What's the tail kit? Tail kit is the part that attaches here to the plumbing that attaches this, the bypass to your plumbing. This is the bypass. And um, so, so our, our default is shipping with uh, three quarter inch um, fittings that you would connect to your plumbing and you can use that like I say on copper or uh, PEX. Now, if you require a different kind of fittings like one inch, let us know, we'll include that uh, for the same cost. Um, and we also have shark bite fittings available. What are shark bite fittings? Well, you've probably heard of shark bites. These are these things here. Can you see that? Oops. Yeah, there it's focused on that. So these are shark bite fittings here. So they're basically a quick connect fitting that can be connected without soldering. And uh, so we have shark bite um, kits for the, for the, um, for the tail kits, okay, that uh, you can get. So they're totally solder free. You can use them with PEX or you can use them for co with copper, either way, and uh, they work great. So, um, and you know, one of the questions I'm often asked is, or people often tell me is that, hey, I don't 
I'm not that good with soldering and things like that. Is there ways to do it solder free? Absolutely there is. And again, I've got a great YouTube video. Now the YouTube video is specifically made about water softener connections, but it's exactly the same connecting a water softener or connecting an air over media iron and sulfur filter. It's identical. So, uh, and again, I've got a YouTube video that shows you how to do that. The thumbnail looks like this. And again, I've got an uh, description down below the link that you can get there. So, uh, Great. Um, so again, we it's a, it comes with three quarter inch fittings. So if your plumbing is half inch, then you would just use reducers to get to that three quarters of an inch. If your plumbing is one inch, then you need to specify that you've got one inch plumbing and we'll include a one inch tail kit um, with the equipment as we ship it to you. Um, and again, um, if you want it for copper for soldering or you just want the um, the uh, shark bite kits, we also have a John Guest ship. Uh, kit. So this is a John Guest kit. So uh, John Guest is um, so John Guest is one of the pioneers that was around for quick connect fittings. I dare say they were around before Shark Bites, to be honest. And they do a great job. And one of the things I like about their fittings compared to can you see that? Yeah, compared to the uh, Shark Bite ones is that it's it's again um, a quick connect fitting you push it in and it seals but this also has a locking collar that you can lock it in place and I like that better than shark bite shark bites because there's two two different methods that's holding that pipe in so I really like that and uh, but definitely if that's a route that you're interested in taking I definitely encourage you to check out that uh, video I spoke about a little bit earlier and uh, what else is happening here uh, disaster number seven. I believe there's about 20 disasters throughout this, by the way. Uh, be sure to know the correctly uh, how to use the, the plumbing that you're using. Years ago, we had an installer here. Uh, we're talking about 15 years ago. And uh, he had heard about PEX fitting and he heard about the PEX ring, but he didn't realize you actually had to crimp that PEX ring on. So this is uh, here. This is a, 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 oh, it's the wrong size. Sorry. Uh, do I have any here? Yeah, here. Okay, so this is a PEX fitting here, and this is the pipe. So what happens, you put a ring on here, you put this on here, and then you have to crimp that ring. Well, this guy <laughs> didn't realize he had to crimp the ring on. He just put the ring on, and uh, so he had some problems when he first started it up. So just make sure that you do some research on whatever kind of uh, plumbing you have, whether it's PEX or whether it's copper, or whether it's shark bites or, or the John Guest stuff, before you start the job. All right, great. Let's see if we're getting some more questions here. I love your questions. Um, what's your opinion on a standalone air injection tank with a compressor that runs with the well pump requires another tank to remove the oxidized iron? Yeah, so I use these. Uh, we installed these, jeez, uh, I don't know, maybe 15, 16 years ago. Um, can't remember the name that it was marketed under. They have these compressors and they're all set up. It's quite a complex system. The thing that really bothered me about them was how unbelievably expensive the compressors were. They were just unbelievably ex uh, expensive. So, and they're the, so because of that, systems were very, very complex. And, uh, and the systems, like I say, were expensive, complex, and they required a lot of maintenance. And there was a lot of things to go wrong. There was a flow switch on there. There was, um, you could hook it up to the, the the well pump, as I guess is how yours is set up. Um, we had a flow switch for ours. Um, but I found the compressors were very finicky. I found that they were difficult to set up. Um, I just had a lot of problems. And it was right about the time that these F over, sorry, this FOB, FOC, FOKs, air over media systems came out. And these were just so much easier, so much less costly. Um, and... Uh, and then, and customers were complaining too in certain circumstances that every time their water run, they heard a zzzz with the compressor running. So, you know, that's, you asked, <laughs> I said, um, you know, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. So, but thank you for the question. And Tech 10 has another question. Light sulfur smells, some low iron and low manganese currently have an iron remover that regenerates with salt. Not sure what media. Thanks, cheers from Sudbury. Well, another fellow Canadian here. And uh, yeah, so like I say, I mean, as long as it works, it works and that's great. Um, I wouldn't replace it, you know, if it's working, I wouldn't replace it just because there's new technology available. I would wait until you start to have problems with it. And then uh, once you find out how much a replacement compressor is, because they're medical grade compressors, 
um, you'll, you'll probably look for something else. Um, but thanks for your question. I really appreciate it. All right, great. So we're getting some great questions. Uh, that's great. Thanks a lot, folks. Also keep in mind, disaster number seven, that when working with PEX plumbing, it's a lot easier to work with than, than copper and things like that, but it restricts the flow more. PEX restricts the flow more than copper does. Why is that? I'll show you. This is a three... So let's see if we can focus on that. Yeah. So in this hand is... Um, Three quarter inch, believe it or not, PEX fitting, and over here is three quarter inch copper fitting. And the, the difference is the inside diameter is so much smaller on the PEX fitting than it is on the copper fitting. So if you're concerned about <laughs> restricting the flow going into the system, then you're far better off to upgrade the plumbing, even if you've got three quarter inch plumbing, but upgrade it to one inch. PEX, if you're going to use PEX, going into and out of the um, FOB, FOC, FOK, or your water softener or whatever, you know, because um, for copper, three quarter inch copper, uh, the maximum flow rate, uh, where is this here? Yeah, for, ma for, for copper, maximum flow rate that you can get through um, three quarter inch is 6.5 gallons per minute, but three quarter inch PEX is only 4.6 gallons per minute. So keep that in mind. You don't want to be restricting your flow. And uh, I've seen it happen. And uh, drain connections. So these systems ship um, with a different fitting than this. So this fitting, let me show you. So this is the fitting that they ship with, okay? And this is what's called a compression fitting. So in other words, you feed the pipe into here. There's a fitting inside that goes into the pipe because you're typically using half inch PEX. And then by turning this, by tightening this, it compresses and holds it in place. I don't like it. I've had trouble with that one. So what I recommend is you just go to your Home Depot or Home Hardware or whatever other uh, hardware store you have and then just get this simple fitting here. This is a three quarter inch female thread to a half inch PEX. And then you put the half inch PEX on here, crimp it on, and now it's hard plumbed in place. And uh, I would use some Teflon tape when you're attaching these two together and some uh, pipe dope to make sure you don't get a leak, but uh, that's the best way to, to attach it. Now for a water softener, it isn't all that critical, but for these FOB, FOCs, FOKs, because we've got the air bubble at the top, right? And remember when it goes through its regeneration cycle, it releases that air bubble. Um, and I've, we've had it happen actually, that using the compression fitting, it actually blew the, um, the drain line right out of the fitting. And yeah, it caused a mess. So, um, so that's why I don't recommend that fitting, especially for FOB, FOC, FOK. So I definitely encourage you to change that fitting over um, if you, uh, when you purchase one of ours. All right. Um, and the, think about the other end of the drain line. So wherever you're putting the other end of the drain line, make sure that's secure. Because again, there's some force when this starts off and the other end of the drain line, if it's just kind of laying there, it's going to knock it out. So, all right. Great. Yeah, so I talked about the drain line coming off and about the fitting that I recommend. Yeah, that didn't go very well. Um, yeah. All right. So um, if there's already water filtration in place, okay, you can, like a water softener, and it's also going to drain, you can put a T in the line and then run that to a mutual drain line. That can be done. But again, keep in mind that on that water softener, again, I would put the same kind of fitting as, I've, as I'm using here and make sure it's secured at both ends because that force will definitely be there when it goes through that cycle. Um, also keep in mind, if it's an older drain line that you're connecting to, it would be a good idea to replace it with a new drain line because they do deteriorate, deteriorate over the years. UV light and that deteriorates the plastic, right? And uh, so you wanna make sure that it's in good shape to be able to handle that burst of air that's, that comes through when it starts in its, uh, in its cycle. Um, yeah, so another disaster I've seen and very similar to what we just talked about was we had a situation where we replaced an older technology iron sulfur filter with one of these. Uh, we hooked up to the drain line, we followed the drain line, it disappeared up into the floor joists and went in through a couple rooms and a couple other places with a sealed, with a drywall ceiling. We couldn't find it, follow it, so we didn't. Well, unfortunately, it had, we didn't realize it had been cobbled together over the years. A bunch of pieces were kind of cobbled together and probably some of them were 30 years old. And it didn't have a problem when the first few times it went through cycles, 
But after, I think it was about a year, year and a half, something like that, it, it suddenly blew one of those connections apart and yeah, it caused water damage again, unfortunately. But anyway, um, so um, be sure to follow that drain line all the way if you're connecting to an older drain line or just run a new one right from the beginning. Uh, it's, it's a far wiser way to do things. Okay. Um, by the way, you know, now's a good time, I guess, as any, and uh, I really got some exciting news and I really want to share it with you guys. Um, here this evening, or when you're watching this, uh, the replay. And that is, um, we've hit some milestones lately. 35,000 subscribers, and I really appreciate everyone that's subscribed to my YouTube channel. That's really great. Um, it's a big achievement for me to, to, to know that you're out there subscribing to the channel and watching my videos. I really appreciate that. But we also hit a couple other milestones. 9 million views. Um, I can't believe it that 9 million people clicked on a video and one of my videos and watched it. I've been doing this for 10 years and that's really, I really appreciate that. But even more important than that to me is 25 million minutes watched. So I mean, yeah, someone can click on a video and watch it for five seconds and say, ah, this is garbage and go somewhere else. But for, for people to devote 25 million minutes to watching my videos, I really appreciate that. So thanks very much. Uh, I really appreciate it. If uh, even got this little spiffy thing, 9 million views. And uh, anyway, so where do you drain it to? So that's the next question. And again, that was a popular question that people are asking about. And uh, so a couple things to keep in mind. It can drain up. It can drain across. It can connect. It can, you, you know, I mean, sometimes when people do it yourselfers, they find the easiest way to drain a water softener is run into a laundry sink. And yeah, you can still do this that with this. But make sure you make sure you're careful that the end of the strain line, wherever it is, if it's going into a laundry sink, you can't just have it sitting there. You're going to have to attach it to something on the side. If you've got this going into a drain, like a floor drain, usually we don't have floor drains in well water situations. But anyway, if you've got it into, going into a floor drain, can you see that? Yeah. Whoop. Doesn't like that. Okay. Uh, if you have something like that going to a floor drain, make sure you secure it in place um, so that when it goes through a backwash cycle, it doesn't flip out. If you've got it going into a drain stack, again, make sure you secure it into place. Very important. So we can go into all of those places, drain stack, things like that. What happens if you don't have any of that, Gary? Um, then you can do something like this. Um, so you can create, put in a, a P-trap and, and create your own drain stack between the floor joists and then run the drain line to that, maintaining the air gap above it. That's totally within code. Uh, I mean, the codes are a little bit different from place to place. Generally, it's, um, what is it? I had a note here what it was. Um, around here, they say, um, it needs to be at least two times, the air gap needs to be at least two times the diameter of the drain line. So this is half inch, so it would have to be two times would be one inch. But then it goes on to say, but in no case, it has to be less than one and a half inches. So in this case, it would be one and a half inches uh, above. That's the air gap that they're, that they're requiring. Now, the problem with air gaps is they're difficult to set up. And, uh, and because, again, when these things go through a cycle, there's a burst of air, so you might get some splashing coming out and things like that. So quite often people hard plumb these. So basically like you would a dishwasher, right? You've got the, the drain line, you put a Y in the drain line, and like, you know, I'm talking about inch and a half um, ABS type drain line, they put a Y in it, and then they put a fitting in it, and they, they hard plumb the pecs from that end to this end. Now that's not 100% um, legal in code, by the building code. So you need to check your local building code. Now, if you're installing this yourself, there's trade-offs, okay? I mean, you can do it by code and I definitely encourage you to do that. But like I say, you know, you might get some splashing coming out from there. You might be coming loose and things like that. Um, I've heard far more complaints about uh, with the air gap, it's splashing out or coming loose or things like that than I've ever heard about any kind of um, you know, drain backing up and uh, the system sucking in uh, sewage. Um, like, uh, that's almost unheard of. So anyway, choose your, you know, choose the way that, my, like my uncle used to say, choose your choice, um, what works uh, best for you. But um, like I say, um, don't be surprised if you end up with hard plumbing it at both ends. And uh, that seems to work best, but there definitely are options. And we even have an air gap that you can get that uh, fits into 
uh, like I said, where was that? That fits into that, um, that fitting that I show here. Um, you know, if you want to do a drain stack, something like that, um, you know, that's definitely an option if that makes sense uh, for you. All right. So um, we talked about, um, <clears throat> and, and that's, you know, that Y situation I said, like a dishwasher is, is often a very, um, it's a very cost effective. It's a very secure. And, uh, and like I say, it, it typically works very well. Um, okay, great. See if we got any more questions coming. Again, please keep those questions coming. I love to answer them. And uh, uh, here, justice for all. Another question. Thanks for, thanks. Whoops. Sorry. There. PEX A doesn't restrict as bad as PEX B like you're showing. Yeah, that's right. And, and that's what I mean. Um, thank you for that comment. I really appreciate that. So there's different there's different kinds of PECs. And that's why I say I encourage you to do the research. Um, all I'm saying is if you need to maintain that flow, do some research to find out if the size of plumbing you're using is actually going to maintain that flow. And, uh, and you know, in uh, cottages and um, in uh, <laughs> cottages and cabins and rural properties, often flow is uh, very precious. <laughs> so, uh, so I definitely do that. And, uh, and, and by the way, I've got a great YouTube video that goes into a lot more detail about uh, drain connections. And again, it was geared toward uh, water softeners when I did it, but it definitely applies 100% for uh, doing with the FOBs, FOCs, and FOKs. Great. Moving along here nicely. Uh, we've talked about that already. Oh, this one. <laughs> so I ran into a situation where a customer called me. Um, it was a property where um, no one was home. It, it was a, it's, it's a cottage. People are only there on the weekends and they hadn't been there for a couple of weeks and they wanted me to go out there and do some maintenance on their water softener. They said, oh, by the way, uh, a plumber was there recently that sold us a, a water softener that they'd had problems with. And uh, so under warranty, they were rebuilding this water softener. Anyway, that's a whole other story. But anyway, so what happened was they took the valve off the water softener and they left the iron filter there. But what they didn't do was they didn't bypass the iron filter. And because the drain lines were hooked together, when the iron filter went to its backwash, the backwash blew out where the water softener was supposed to be attached and made this big iron sludge mess all over the floor in this beautiful cottage. Um, luckily, this part wasn't in a, it was in an unfinished area. However, there was a beautifully finished area just outside of it and it spilled into that area and it damaged the floor and made a huge mess. So unfortunately, um, I don't know why this plumber did this. As it ended up uh, not that long after that, we ended up replacing their water softener with one of ours because the customer was just fed up with uh, all this stuff going on. So anyway, so just be very careful when you join two drain lines together that um, that water can come from either direction or, or the, the regeneration can, uh, the backwashing can from either direction and uh, make sure if you do that, that you bypass the valve. I don't know why they even took the valve with them, but anyway, that's what they did. Um, yeah, so let's talk about three-way bypasses. So this is my pet peeve topic that I run into far too many times. What's a three-way bypass, Gary? I got one here. <clears throat> This is a three-way bypass. And I'll hold it here so that you can make sure that it's, you can see that it's in focus. So how these things, so obviously this is an old one. Uh, someone didn't have a bypass on their water softener. So a plumber, when they installed their water softener, they put this in. And basically how this worked was, uh, did I put some arrows on here? I did, okay. So water flowed in through here, went into the water softener, then came out of the water softener, flowed through here. And then this needed to be shut. So water flows in, water flows out, everything is good. The problem is when someone ends up doing some work and yeah, often it ends up being plumbers, I'm afraid they, and they need to shut this off for whatever reason, they'll close this valve, close this valve and realize this valve's already closed. No problem. They'll do whatever work they have to do. And when they come back, they'll open up this valve, they'll open up this valve and they'll open up this valve while they're at it. So now what happens is the water goes into the water softener here, comes out of the water softener here, but it's much easier to take a shortcut and go across here. And then what happens is we get a phone call that my water softener isn't working anymore. 
if it's a new water softener, one of our water softeners, they're saying, hey, there's something wrong with your water softener. If it's an older water softener, they say, oh, it's time to replace the water softener. So whenever I go into a, a property that I've never been before, or someone that has a three-way bypass, I always check that first. We probably get one service call a month on this, and it just happens so often. That's why I'm not real big on putting in three-way bypasses. So one suggestion, if you already have a three-way bypass, to make sure this doesn't happen to you, is that you can close this one and take unscrew this little screw and take the handle off. And that way, no one will mess with it, right? And uh, just keep the handle nearby in case you need it. Oh, sorry. Why do they have the three-way bypass in the first place? And that's so if ever anything went terribly wrong with the water softener, then you could close this valve, close this valve, open up this valve, and you'd at least have water in your household. Um, but like I say, all of our FOBs, FOCs, FOKs, water softeners, all our uh, backwashing equipment all have built-in bypasses, so you don't have to worry about that. So I definitely don't encourage you to put one in by yourself. All right, great. Uh, yep, yeah, that was disaster number 12. Uh, plumbing backwards. Yeah, that happens. Um, although these things have arrows on them, and even the bypasses, they're arrow-shaped. You probably can't see that from there. Actually, if I zoom in, you probably can. Yeah, you see they're kind of arrow-shaped. Okay, so that's the out, and that's the in. So, um, so because of that, it indicates that's in and that's out. But occasionally, someone will plumb them up backwards, and then they'll wonder why they don't work. So, uh, so that's something to watch for um, if, uh, uh, you know, whether you're doing the, the installation yourself or you've got a plumber doing it, just kind of keep an eye on what's the inlet and what's the outlet. It's important. Um, great. Um, so drain line installation. So another tip that I encourage you to use is to use opaque drain line. Um, not solid white. And the reason is when you start the backwash cycle, um, when you first uh, put this into service, you're going to see some debris coming. First, there's going to be just air coming through, and then you're going to see water coming through, and then some debris coming tr through. And that way you can monitor what's going on. Um, you can also tell that when water is flowing through here, you can see it. I mean, yeah, if it's an opaque, what I mean by opaque is this stuff, right? Opaque, you can't see through it. Um, if it's opaque, yeah, if you grab it, you can feel the vibration of water flowing through it, and that's how you, way that you can tell that water's flowing through. But opaque is definitely better. So I definitely encourage you to do that. Whatever you do, don't use that clear vinyl stuff, the kind of stuff that folds down onto itself. That stuff is horrible. And, uh, and it can actually, after the, a few years, it can actually clog itself just by collapsing. Oh, we've run into that stuff it's too many times that other people have used for installations. And uh, yeah. That was number 14, collapsing drain line onto itself. Um, yeah, so let's see if we've got some more questions here. And uh, Justice for All has, uh, in my area, an RPZ is three quarter inch would be required to prevent cross connection. And yeah, that's right. And that's the plumbing code in your area. And uh, and, and like I say, there, there's there's all, you have to check your local codes and uh, and and see if uh, see what's what's required, and that way you know for sure, right? Great, thank you for uh, for adding that. We I really appreciate it. Okay, great. So, um, so uh, programming the correct setting. So again, I've got a YouTube video that actually goes into programming, but um, what's really good <laughs> is that these things already come when you order one of our Hume. Um, water filtration, air over media, iron sulfur filters, FOB, FOC, FOK, they're already programmed. So you don't have to go through the programming. Um, all you need to do is you need to set the time. And uh, I can do this, I think. Yeah. So just set clock. You see the hours flash up or down. Set clock. Minutes flash up or down. Set clock. You're done. The only other thing you need to keep in mind is um, the, the regen time. To get to that, you press the the next and the up button together. So those are the days, you don't change that. But uh, this is 2 a.m. So you don't want to have this regenerating the same time as your water regenerates. So if your water softener goes at 2 a.m., then I normally suggest having this go at 1 a.m. Now your water softener will be metered. And uh, so because of that, it being metered, uh, it be very rare that these would ever go at the same time because these go every three days. They regenerate every three days, but the water softener is based on usage, so it likely wouldn't be on the same time, but definitely you don't want them both going at the same time. 
Um, by the way, regeneration takes uh, 45 minutes. The first cycle is 15 minutes. That's the backwash. The second cycle is 30 minutes. That's the air draw. And um, so the only settings you might have to change in the future, and again, I definitely encourage you to go with the factor default settings. 99.9% um, .9 of the time, that's all you need, okay? Uh, is there something you might have to change? Yeah, you might have to change if, um, uh, if you've got more people there than the system is, is, uh, uh, allows for, just because of the amount of iron you have or the amount of um, flow rate from your well pump, you need to have a smaller system than that, then what you can do is you can change, again, the next and the up, and just go to every two days. So it just regenerates more often. And uh, so, that, so that's uh, what you could do with that one. All right, and uh, what else might you need to change? Longer air draw. So if you're finding that, yeah, it gets rid of the, the sulfur smell, but not 100%, you know, that kind of thing, then what you can do is you can uh, set up a cycle for it to um, so draw air longer. And same with the backwash. The backwash, if you find that after it's gone through its cycle, you're getting some brown water for a little bit, you know, the first couple toilet flushes of the day or that kind of thing right after the regeneration day. So you can uh, change those settings, and I'll show you how to do those. Again, don't only change them if there's a problem. Actually, let me zoom in here. There you go. So you press the next and the down button. Hold that down. Okay, so it's just filtering up there. You press next. So here, that's 50 minutes. That's the backwash. So again, if you're getting uh, dark water um, after the day after it regenerates, then you can add five minutes onto there. Okay, next. And again, if you have a situation where um, it's it's drawing air, but um, you know it it's not it's not a hundred percent there, so you can add another ten minutes onto that. Next, and you're back to the home position. All right, great, and. Uh, and again, like I say, I've got a great uh, YouTube video that talks about uh, the programming itself. So if you want some more specific information or more in-depth information, a link in the link in the description down below. All right, great. So, um, and again, you know, some people ask, uh, well, Gary, uh, you know, this is uh, great information, and uh, where do you get this stuff? Well, go to our websites, either watereastore.ca in Canada, watereastore.com in the U.S., free shipping and discount pricing, and I definitely encourage you to uh, check that out. All right, great. So, um, okay, so now you've got, you know, you've done the plumbing, you've hooked up to your plumbing, you've uh, done the drain line, so now you need to put it into service. So putting into service is, uh, again, super easy. So, you know, what, once you've, you make sure it's in bypass, turn that around like that. Okay, make sure it's in bypass. So then you turn on the water from your water supply and you, you make sure that there's no leaks. Okay, assuming there's no leaks, then you go to the next stage. So the next stage is you, you put it into backwash. So just turn it like this so you can see it. So again, we hold down the regen button. We hold it down for five seconds. After five seconds, you'll hear the motor start up. Just like that. Now, normally yours would say 15 minutes, but remember, just a few seconds ago, I changed the settings on here, right? So it's counting down from 20 now. Yes, it is. And uh, so as it's, as it's counting down, then on the inlet side of the bypass valve, that's this one here, you open it halfway, okay? And when you open up halfway, you're going to see through that drain line, of course, which is connected up here, up here, right? It's a drain line, opaque drain line. You're going to see air going through, and, uh, and after about a minute or so, a little bit longer, you'll start to see water coming through and then some dirt and that kind of thing. And then you just let it run to the drain. And what that's doing, it's filling up the tank, pushing out the air, but it's also backwashing the fines out of the media. And it's running that to the drain. So then as that counts down, I usually let it go for about 10 minutes. And as you're getting a solid flow of just water coming out, then you can go to the inlet side and open that up all the way. Um, if you get, and uh, <clears throat> so once you open it up all the way, then you can open up the other side all the way. Like that. 
So now it's servicing the house. So just at this stage, make sure nobody's using any water in the house. So then let it go through its whole cycle. Once it finishes its whole cycle, then go somewhere in the house that has good flow, like a laundry sink, a bathtub, something like that, a large tap, and let the water run there because it's going to flush out all the debris that's accumulated inside there. And, uh, and then you're in service and see how it goes. Now, if you start to get some gray water or something like that for the first day or two, that's just because you're still getting some fines coming out of the media. Either just use the water and let it go, or you can regenerate it again manually to, to, uh, to clean it out and regenerate manually just by holding down the regen button and starting it up on a cycle. And that's how you put them into service. Pretty straightforward, right? Disaster number five. 15, sorry, is not flushing all the carbon out and ending up with gray water and mild staining in the toilets and that. They can easily be clean, but it's a pain, right? And uh, so <laughs> the next thing you need to do is don't just forget about it and, you know, pat yourself on the back and go away. Check it. You know, come back a few hours later, make sure nothing's leaking, make sure everything looks okay. Um, the first time it goes through, you know, you may want to regenerate it again just to see it go through the cycle, make sure there's no leaks. And then the first time it goes through a cycle itself, uh, re a regeneration itself, it's going to be after three days, then, um, you know, again, check it, go downstairs, check it out, make sure that nothing's leaking and go from there. And, uh, um, and if, by the way, we were talking about installation earlier, if you install one of these in a finished area, I always encourage you to put it on top of a boot tray or a shoe, tr shoe tray, you know, one of those rubber things you know, with the rim around it. And that way, if you have any minor leaking or whatever, it, it collects on there and doesn't ruin the floor, right? Um, great. So another thing I see way too often is these tanks. So what happens is when you've got cold water passing through a warm, like in the summertime, a warm, humid area, you get sweating, you get condensation. So what happens, you get condensation on, on the fiberglass tank, it leaks down, makes a mess of the floor, but even worse, mold grows on it. And I see this mold growth all the time. And that's why all of our Hume uh, water filtration, iron and sulfur filters and water softeners and any other backwashing filters all come with these neoprene jackets. And these neoprene jackets are great because literally they are, um, they're just like a jacket. And you know, you can retrofit these if you've already got an iron and sulfur filter or a water softener or anything else that's sweating in that. Um, these are great. You can have them on, on, on these things for five, for 10 years. You take them off and there's not a spot of uh, mold or not a, or no condensation on the floor. It's amazing. And you can actually take these things off and wash them. And you know what the best thing is? You don't even need to disconnect this to, a, to put these jackets on. You literally just drape them around, zip them up, and you're good to go. Um, they're phenomenal. And uh, I'm so glad I found them because I'm so sick and tired of seeing these uh, water filtration equipment that's just covered in mold. And you'd be shocked at how many restaurants I see these things in just covered in mold in the restaurants. I can't believe the health department lets them get away with it. Uh, yeah. So, um, all right, great. So, uh, here. So let's see what else we got going on here. Oh, yeah. So here's a, a great... Uh, and again, I've got a, a YouTube video that shows you exactly how to size these jackets, um, how to install them, how to figure out what size you need. Um, and again, some, I got a link in the description down below and uh, that's phenomenal. So, okay, let's see if we got some more questions coming in here. Again, keep them coming. I'm here to answer them all. Justice for all. Do you wholesale to professional plumbers? Um, we have, that's a really great, good question. We do up to a point. I mean, um, we're not a manufacturer, you know, so we have to buy them from a distributor. So we do sell to a lot of plumbers and we give quantity discounts. So uh, if you're a plumber and you're buying one jacket or one water softener, not much I can do. If you're buying one a month, I can definitely do something for you. If you're buying two jackets or five or 10, I mean, not that long ago, we sent, I think, 40 or 50 jackets to Alaska. So again, that guy got a deal. You know, so it depends on the quantities that you're going through uh, and how often, right? So uh, we can definitely do some pricing. And we, we've actually got a program coming up specifically for plumbers. It's just not quite ready yet. So, uh, but thank you for that question. I really appreciate it. 
And Jay, welcome, Gary. Well, welcome. Thanks for uh, tuning in. I appreciate you being here, Jay, and I appreciate your comment and just saying hello. I appreciate that, definitely. All right, great. So let's see what else we got for you here today. And uh, whoops. Great. Disaster number 19. Customer had equipment installed by others and slowed down their water flow. <laughs> and what we found out was the customer had a large home, so they had one inch plumbing. But the person that installed the water filtration equipment just had a three quarter inch tail kit. So they took the one inch plumbing down to three quarters of an inch through the system and then back up to one inch. Well, yeah, that slowed down the flow. And it was just because they didn't either didn't bother to check ahead of time, didn't, I don't know why, but I, the circumstances were that they put in a one inch tail kit. We switched back out. So they had put in a three quarter inch tail kit. We switched it to a one inch tail kit, restored their flow. Everybody was happy. Uh, frozen burst uh, tanks. Yeah, so again, that happens uh, it, in cottage country too, not just in Texas. Uh, people don't drain them properly. And again, I, t I talked about winterizing a little bit earlier. And I definitely, if you're in that situation, I definitely encourage you to check out that. Uh, that and uh, <laughs> check out the winterizing uh, video if you're going to be planning to winterize it, because you may have to adjust how you're going to install this and where you're going to install this uh, when you're doing that. Um, also, make sure you make all your connections tight and proper. Um, this is disaster number 21. I see this happening uh, not frequently, but at least a couple times a year where somebody else is working nearby, you know, the cable guy or somebody like that. And there's, you know, drain lines running here and there's something else running here and that kind of thing. And the guy snags it walking by. So the situation that I saw was a drain line. I guess it wasn't very tightly connected. He snagged it and knocked it off. Well, the guy didn't know what to do with it so he just plucked it into a, a drain stack that was nearby so of course the first time this went through a regeneration cycle 45 gallons of water went spewing onto the floor no one knew why and a little bit of research we found out why so uh yeah that's uh, definitely it and um another thing we talked about frozen equipment later but let's talk about frozen drain lines so occasionally i get asked by people about the drain line and they say well can i just run it outside and uh, yeah, you can run it outside, but remember, um, not, not with these, but with a water softener, the sodium in the water would kill the grass. Um, but the other thing, the iron that comes out of this is quite dark brown, rusty color, and that's like fudge, and it's disgusting. So you don't really want that coming out there, right? So, um, but the other thing is it'll freeze. And uh, yeah, we've installed them at an angle down, and we've done all kinds of other things. They always freeze. So uh, keep that in mind. And that's why uh, typically we always drain them into the septic, septic system to make sure they don't freeze. Unless you've got a, a, a dedicated drain stack that goes to a dry well, that's, that's the perfect situation. But uh, yeah, that's uh, definitely uh, what you need to consider there. Disaster number 23. You may have iron in your water and you may have bacteria in your water. But if you've got iron bacteria, that's that slime. You've got that slime in your toilet and things like that. This is not the equipment for that. An air over media system, doesn't matter if it's FOB, FOC, FOK, FON, whatever, it's not going to work. Okay, that slime is going to build up inside the tank. You need a chemical injection system, uh, basically a chlorine system that injects chlorine into the water, oxidizes that and kills that iron bacteria, and then removes it and goes on from there. We're not talking about those today. Um, see if we got any other questions to answer. Uh, just tuning in James just tuning in well no problem James we have the replay available for you right after this is done so you can check it out whenever you want do you have a video that discusses install and use it to recap what I missed well <laughs> that's exactly what I just mentioned so like I say we have um, we do a replay of this whole video so after this video is done you can actually watch it right then i'll do a little bit trimming on it uh, tomorrow or on saturday and clean it up a little bit um, but all the information is there and it's evergreen it'll be there forever so you can uh, uh, check back to it anytime you want and uh, another question here from tech 10 do these units reintroduce air every time water is drawn to maintain the air bubble or only uh, during the regen Great question, Tech 10. I appreciate that. No, they only reintroduce air when it goes through its regeneration cycle every three days. So it relies on that air bubble to maintain that for you uh, during those three days. And, uh, and that's great. So um, 
All right, so I do new videos every week. And again, my uh, YouTube channel is Gary the Water Guy. Um, upcoming live stream, streams are promoted through our, um, through our community tab on our uh, Gary the Water Guy YouTube channel. And uh, I'm going to thank you for watching and for participating with your questions and comments. And I'll see you next time.